Uh, recruit the bad parts. Uh, I really hope this is going to be a quick one, like a lightning talk, really, because I think most, mostly Red Query is, is just great. Um, I think it's, it's loved by the community for the developer experience and the user experience it provides. And I know that's a bold claim, so I tried to bring some evidence to back that up. Uh, if we look at the weekly uh, download numbers on NPM, I think Red Query has grown a lot this year from uh, almost 4 million to, to, to 6 million uh, weekly downloads. Now, I think those are huge numbers. Um, and if we compare that to the React numbers, which is also React is growing strong, sitting at about 27 million weekly downloads, uh, all of a sudden the curve doesn't look as impressive anymore. But I think we can still kind of take away from that that uh, Red Query is used in about 20% of all React applications or in, in almost every fifth app. And you know, some of those apps, they have millions of users themselves, uh, like Sentry, Blue Sky, or, or JetGPT. So I think Red Query really gets a lot of exposure. Um, now, of course, download numbers and usage and exposure aren't everything, right? Just because something is used doesn't actually mean that it's liked. Um, so maybe a better way would be to look at surveys. Um, there is the State of Frontend 2024 survey, which asked the question, uh, which tools have you used to fetch data in the last year? And now I'm not going to nitpick here that, that Red Query is not a data fetching library like, like Axios or Fetch that are listed here. But behind those, it actually comes in with a very positive sentiment uh, because only 2.8% of people who used it uh, didn't like it. And uh, State of React had a similar question around utilities for loading and managing data. And if we group that by positive sentiment, then tends the query actually comes out at the top with, with a little bit over 44%. So I'm really happy that developers seem to like the library because I've been maintaining it for the last four years. Uh, my name is Dominic. I'm a software engineer living in Vienna, where I will be joining the front-end platform team at Sentry uh, in the next month. And you can find me as TK Dodo online almost everywhere. And I also have a blog where I write about React and TypeScript and, of course, React Query. Now, I've written and talked a lot about why React Query is great, and I, I still think it really is, but you know, everything is, is a trade-off. And if, if we use any technology, um, it's usually a good trade-off if the thing we are getting in return is worth more to us or is better for us than, than what, we are, what we are trading in. Now, I think React Query is really a good trade-off for most situations, but of course, there are cases where it might not be the, the best fit or the perfect fit. So today, uh, I want to talk about these cases, but also maybe debunk some myths that I've heard about it that make it sound like it's bad when it actually maybe isn't. Yeah, so maybe uh, the talk should be more like Red Query the trade-offs. Okay. <clears throat> Let's get started with the first point, uh, the elephant in the room, which is the bundle size. Uh, that React Query has a huge bundle size is something that I often hear as, as its largest drawback. Um, and to get to the bottom of that, we first have to establish what the bundle size isn't. Because it's not what you see on NPM, right? This is the size that gets shipped to the developers when they install the library. Um, yes, it's over 700 uh, kilobytes, but it also includes all the sources and source maps for you to better debug the library. And we also ship some code mods for, uh, for, for the upgrades that we have. This is definitely not the size that gets shipped to the consumer. Okay, it's also not what you see on Bundlephobia. I think Bundlephobia is a good uh, site to get a quick overview, but um, it doesn't understand ESM properly, which I think no, I don't think anybody does that. But um, like we ship a, a special legacy build for all the bundlers, like Webpack 4, that isn't as optimized, and Bundlephobia picks up on that. So whatever you see here is also still. Uh, too large, and, and if you use a more modern bundler, you will get a smaller output. So I like, really like Bundle.js to get uh, like a good overview, because it just um, builds what we export on the fly uh, with ESBuild, and then it shows the size impact. So if we export everything from Rare Query, we get to 12.4 kilobytes uh, minzipped. Now that's, that's not nothing, but I also don't think that's a lot. And if we care about size, we should probably use Brotly compression instead of gzip. So if we do that, that gets us to a nice round uh, 12 kilobyte. And that is really when we use every feature that the library has to offer. But this is not the typical starting point. So usually, uh, we can get quite far with just exporting uh, a query client, the provider, and probably use query and use mutation. And if we do that, 
if we narrow it down, this gets us to under 10 kilobytes. It's 9.63. So don't get me wrong, I think bundle size is an important thing to look at uh, before adding a dependency. Um, but the debate about what is lightweight and what isn't is not really the most important one when it comes to such a central piece like your aging state manager, especially because there is one metric that is easily left out, and that is the bundle size you save by code you don't have to write. I think a library like RecQuery really pays for itself because the more you use it, the more it saves you code that you don't have to write yourself. So when uh, checking the bundle size of a library, it's important to not think about the size that it adds uh, immediately, but also about the, what it can save you in the long run. And on that scale, I think RecQuery is a clear win because most custom solutions um, would probably be larger or they might fail in some edge cases because, uh, yeah, um, caching and caching validation is really hard. Okay, the next myth I want to look at uh, is uh, the fact that with React Query you can't even fetch on a button click. And I, I get that a lot, and the argument is that it's hard for React Query to do imperative data fetching. And it's true because a React Query is declarative by default. What we do is uh, we um, uh, write the use query hook and we pass a query key and a query function to it, and it runs automatically for us. Now, this code would try to read uh, tasks from the cache, and if they don't exist, it will go and fetch them for us. Now, so, so far, uh, that looks good, but now let's try adding some filtering to our task list. Um, when, we add, when we add a filter form, uh, we then on apply callback, and when that gets called, we want to refetch that uh, with those new filters. So if we explore what use query returns on our own, we might find the refetch function, um, and we might want to just pass those filters to refetch, which I think this seems reasonable, but except that a refetch doesn't take any arguments, so this just doesn't work. And I get the frustration about this, but it's just not how React Query was designed to work. Because see, if we have a, 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 like a hard-coded key like tasks, um, and we'd refetch that with different arguments, we would not only overwrite the data that we'd cached uh, for those other filters, we would also run in race conditions that uh, we would get like when we we're fetching in, in use effect. So React Query has solved both of these problems with the declarative approach by putting all our dependencies, and that is everything that we use inside uh, uh, the query function, into the query key. And that means we have to store our applied filters somewhere, and in this example, I've just put them into, into React state. Now, when those applied filters change, uh, the key changes and React Query will see a new query key, and then it will fetch the tasks automatically for us again. And this approach will get us from the imperative thinking, like if I click that button, I want to do some fetching, towards the declarative form of, you know, I want data that matches this state, and how it changes is actually irrelevant. And it's also relevant where we store those applied filters. I've used uh, use state before, but it's actually a pretty, pretty forward change to uh, make a navigation with different search params if we use something like, like Tanstack Router. Uh, this is, of course, type safe, depending on the search param uh, schema that we have defined on our route. And now we get a bunch of things for free, like, for example, shareable URLs or browser back button navigation, which I think is really cool. Another cool thing is that if we change the filters back to something that we've already searched, like I said before, we get an instant result. And that's because React Query caches everything separately by the key. Uh, in that sense, it's a simple document cache where the complete responses will be stored for any given key. Um, so yeah, in, in this example, this also means that if a task is both in status open and in priority high, it will be in both of these caches because you know, there is no normalized caching in React Query. In a normalized cache, every piece of data is stored only once and other parts only reference it to avoid that data duplication. Now, there are dedicated solutions for GraphQL, for example, like Apollo Client or Urkel, and they offer normalized caching because they are aware of the schema and the relations between the entities. But React Query, in this regard, it knows nothing. It doesn't know what is in the cache. It only knows the, prom uh, the promise that gets returned. Now, we have a long list of feature comparisons in our docs, and normalized caching is pretty much the only thing that uh, we flat out don't support. Uh, it's a pretty hard problem to solve, and it can also add a lot of complexity to your caching logic. 
So the trade-off that we've taken is to not support it. I also think that for most applications, just refetching after an invalidation uh, probably works fine and is also easier to reason about. So yeah, I mean, if, if you're using GraphQL and you need normalized caching, React Query might not be the best fit for you. There is, however, a community solution that I want to highlight, which is called Normie. Um, it tries to bring automatic normalization and data updates to data fetching libraries. And it has integrations for React Query, SWR, and RTK Query. So um, you might want to check that out if that sounds interesting to you. OK. Yeah, so we don't do normalized caching uh, because we want to keep things simple. But still, one thing I hear a lot is that React Query uh, is complicated and has a, has a steep learning curve. Now, I think if something is easy to understand, um, that's always subjective, right? There could be something straightforward uh, to understand for you that's a total mystery to me. But I think it's undeniable that uh, React Query, like, like any concept that is worth applying, has a learning curve. And it also has an API surface that isn't like the smallest one. Um, I went a lot into the details of React Query's API design at my last talk at the React Advanced Conference earlier this year. So if you want an in-depth look at that, um, please check that out. But just to touch on the topic, I think Tanner has a great tweet uh, summarizing the design goals of React Query, where he says that the Query API is actually medium-sized when you unpack it all, but the most important part is that you can understand and learn how to use it by starting with a single function that provides 80% of the entire value proposition first try. From there, the rest of its API can be gradually learned if needed. So while the Query API might seem overwhelming at first, we don't need to learn everything at once. We can start just with use query with the minimal required uh, options, which is the query key and the query function. And we already get a ton of things from just using this simple code. Um, we get caching and requested duplication. There are stale while revalidate background updates, global state management, um, retries, like the list goes on and on. And then later, we might add a mutation to uh, make some updates and then tie that back to the query with uh, query invalidation. Now, that's already a bit more code, but with those two, we can get really, really far in our application. And once our you know, application complexity grows, we might want to look into some more deeper things that React Query has to offer. Uh, maybe we want to add an optimistic update here and there in one of our places, or maybe we need an infinite query uh, sometimes. Now, those are a bit more involved. And then all the way up on this uh, powerful and flexible scale, we have our plugin system and our very low-level uh, cache subscriptions that we are, for example, using to build uh, our dev tools. Now, those are really powerful and flexible. Um, but once you reach a certain application complexity, you might actually be probably happy that those exist as well. But I think the Query API is absolutely designed to evolve with you. So yeah, uh, don't believe that it's necessary to learn everything from the start, if that feels overwhelming. Yes, there is a lot to learn, but we can definitely get there incrementally. OK. Um, so once we've learned the API, and we're thinking that it's actually pretty great, uh, we want to start to manage all the state with it, right? Um, but since React Query is bad, it really doesn't want us to do that. It's really designed to work just with async state only. Because it's an async state manager that knows about the needs of the service state that we are caching. It knows that the data we are seeing is only a snapshot of the source of truth from the time when we fetched it, and that the actual source of truth lives on the server. So what it tries to do is it tries to revalidate and keeps our data up to date because it's also a data synchronization tool. And it might even make some assumptions about our network connection when it gets that state. And it might actually retry getting that state, too. Now, I think these are all things that we love about React Query. Um, but it's not something that we need when we want to manage some synchronous state, like, for example, a sidebar toggle. If I were to write that code in React Query, this is probably what it would look like. But don't do this. Uh, this is it's far from ideal. Uh, we need to do a bunch of things here. We would need to come up with a unique key, like sidebar state, that doesn't um, collide with anything else that we have in our application. 
we don't even have a query function here because there's nothing asynchronous to do. We just pass data with initial data synchronously and then update it uh, with set query data. And lastly, we need to turn off a bunch of config options uh, to actually stop React Query from trying what it wants to do out of the box, which is managing and synchronizing that, that asynchronous state. So I think doing something like this um, is not easy to get right. It's also a bit verbose, and it's not very efficient either. So the split in client and service state that we have is really on purpose because they have different needs. So I would really use the right tool for the right job. And there are plenty of other solutions uh, to manage client state. Uh, for example, one that I like is Zustand because it's minimal, efficient, and, and unopinionated. All we have to do here is define a store with our state and then the actions to update it. And then I've created a custom hook uh, just to keep the same interface that I had in the previous implementation. And something similar uh, that I also quite like is xState store, which um, looks pretty much the same, but it works a bit better in TypeScript because the types are inferred and it's also event driven. Um, but the thing here is like, there are no surprises with either one. They're both perfectly capable of managing uh, that client state for us. So I think they're definitely better choices than just to use React Query for everything. Okay, um, so the last point that I have, kind of like a bonus point, I think it's, it's a bit funny that uh, sometimes I hear the question, like why do we even need a third party library to do something as basic as data fetching in React? Uh, why, why isn't this just built into React? And I can't really answer that because I don't work on React, but I certainly get the frustration um, that we don't have something, uh, an Asian primitive built into React, like there is, for example, a create resource in, uh, in SolidJS. But I think the reason for that could be that the React team really tries to get an API right before they actually ship it. And as an example, um, I've often wondered, or I think lots of us have often wondered, why we don't have uh, context selectors in uh, React. Um, that's something a lot of people have been requesting to get those fine-grained uh, subscriptions to a React context. I think it's the reason why all those other state management libraries even exist, is that this, this doesn't exist. Um, so in this example, we would have a settings context, um, with a bunch of settings probably, and then a theme on top of that, and use theme would only subscribe uh, to that theme. And then on top of that, we would have use color, which um, we should only re-render the component that uses it when that specific color changes. Um, now this doesn't exist, and I think it's probably not because it would be too hard to implement, but I think it's because the React team has a different vision. A place where we can call the new use operator inside use memo, and then React will bail out of rendering if we return the same value. Now I think this already composes a lot better than selectors, and eventually it might lead to a place uh, where we can just write the same code without use memo at all, thanks to the React compiler. Now, I think that's a great vision, but it takes time to get there. So uh, this, this is not real syntax, this doesn't exist. And I think with data fetching, it was kind of like a similar story because everyone just wanted to have use query, but the React team just thinks bigger. I think suspense is a beautiful architecture where your components get decoupled from handling loading and error state. And it also works really, really well with TypeScript because in this case, data can never be undefined. And of course, the, the React vision goes beyond client-side data fetching um, now that we have uh, async server components. I really wish I had a quote from the uh, React team, but I couldn't find a good one. So I'm just going to say it myself, that suspense and server components are the async primitive that we've been waiting for. And yeah, if you're working with a framework that uh, supports server components, then please use them. And until then, uh, feel free to use Query. Thank you. <laughs>